Welcome everyone to this SDSN webinar, Climate Change Impacts on Mining Operations and Mining Territories. We're so honored to have you all with us today. Today's webinar is taking place in Zoom. Uh, because it's a webinar, all of you are going to be muted with your cameras turned off, but please feel free to send us questions for our panelists by using either the chat function or the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. Today's webinar will also be recorded and we'll share the recording with all of you shortly after the event. If for some reason you have to leave or you're dropped out, uh, please just use the same login and sign on with us again. It's my pleasure to give the floor to Renato Simonelli, president of Geopark Quadrilatero Ferifero, uh, which is a member of the SDSN, and he's gonna share some opening remarks to kick off today's webinar. Yeah, okay. Um, good afternoon to all of you. It's a special regards for, for this global audience. It's very impressive how global it is. Uh, I'll be the moderator if there is a need in case of this, this afternoon. Uh, welcome to the webinar series that we call Visions to SDG in, in Mining Territories. And I would like to introduce maybe the webinar uh, in, in some keywords, let's say in a way to to make the, the, the start involved more quick. The 70 SDGs, that's one reference for the webinar, the mining operators, the territories, uh, the big issues that will be targeting in the next webinars, and the big issue of today, climate change. Okay. So let's 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 start and um, I'll then introduce the first speaker. Uh, Dr. Paulo Artacho, just a minute. Okay, Dr. Paulo Artacho is a Brazilian expert on the links between the Amazon and the climate change. He holds a PhD in environmental physics from the University of Sao Paulo and has studied the effects of deforest deforestations on the carbon and hydrological cycles for over 40 years. He has also worked in, at NASA, Lund University, Stockholm University, and Harvard University. He is also a member of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. So, Paulo, it's a pleasure to have you here. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. So I, I have to share my screen. So if you can cancel your sharing, I can share mine. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, basically, uh, my task here is to update you on the impacts on the latest news from IPCC on the impacts of climate change in our environment and our society. So basically the central issue of climate change is that the global emissions of greenhouse gases have continued to rise uh, even after the pandemic, even after 50 years that science uh, alerted the society and the governments that uh, we are going to a very unsustainable path uh, in terms of climate change because of the, the growing greenhouse gas emissions. Right now, every year, we are emitting about 60 gigatons of CO2 equivalent of, of greenhouse gases to the global atmosphere. Uh, and this, uh, besides the Paris Agreement and all the international agreement, this is growing up to by two to 3% every year when IPCC recommends that we should decrease the emissions by 7% every year from 2020 to 2050, uh, reaching net zero in 2050 and sequester carbon in the second part of this century. That's a huge task for our society, but it has to be done if we wanted to have a stable climate in the second part of this century. As a result of these emissions, uh, the IPCC make forecast for uh, how will be the equilibrium temperature in the second part of this uh, century. And basically 
if you follow the emissions like you are doing today with an increase of two, 3% a year, we can reach uh, a, a temperature of about 4.3 degrees Celsius in average for the whole globe. If you follow the Paris Agreement like you are following right now in a more or less loose way, we can reach 3.7 degrees of average heating. And if you follow very strictly the Paris Agreement, we will heat up the planet by 2.80 degrees Celsius. So as you can see, we are very far away from the target of the Paris Agreement of stabilizing the global temperature in between 1.2 and 2 degrees. So we have to reduce emissions deeply as quickly as possible, as was announced by the synthesis report from the IPCC that was released two days ago uh, in Geneva. So basically, uh, the message from the science is becoming more and more and more clear. Uh, but what this means in terms of global average warming, what this means geographically, because nobody lives in the whole planet. So basically, for instance, for a four degrees global warming, the increase in temperature in South America could be something in between five to 5.6 degrees. In the Arctic region, I mean, uh, Russia and the permafrost region and North Canada, this increase in temperature can be about 6.5 to 7 degrees. So basically, this is an increase in temperature that has not been seen over the last 100,000 years, at least in our planet. So it will have a very major economic and social impact. But temperature is just one indication of climate change. One important ingredient is the change in precipitation. So what we see is that if you increase the global temperature by four degrees, we will see that Latin America, in particular, Amazonia and central parts of Brazil will be much drier than they have been over the last decades, as well as the Mediterranean, Europe, South Africa, and Central America. So this will have an important social consequences. And one of them is the soil humidity that will change dramatically with the increase in temperature and, in, and the changes in the precipitation pattern. So basically, we will see that the soil humidity that is critical for agriculture will affect a lot of the central Brazil region where most of the soybean and meat production happens in Brazil, but it also will affect the Central America, Central United States, as you can see, all the uh, Mediterranean area. So this will have a very important impact in terms of food production. Another important aspect of climate change is the increase in climate extremes. So we are observing that if you, one event was happening every five, sorry, every 50 years before the Industrial Revolution, if we allow the climate to heat up by, by four degrees, this single event will happen 39 times more frequently, and we have five times, will be five times more intense. We are already observing these events. These are not just for the future climate, actually you are observing that uh, right now. And with the every increment of global warming, the uh, IPCC report that was released uh, just uh, two days ago, shows that the regional change becoming much more pronounced from 1.5 degrees, two degrees, three degrees or four degrees. So you can see, that if, if you act very quickly, reducing emissions in all sectors, basically we can avoid the catastrophic climate change and the action is with our society, with the industry and with the governments to avoid the worst possible scenario. And in, in, in this latest IPC report also details in the land-based system, as well as the ocean and coastal ecosystem, that as we increase 
the target temperature from 1.5 to 3 or 4 degrees, basically the risk grows up very, very quickly. And the number of people that could be exposed to a dangerous climate change uh, goes up to from 100 million to billions of people. So that's a scenario that certainly we have to avoid as much as possible. And then uh, it's important also we think on the future generations, our kids, our grandkids, uh, what will happen with them? Basically, you know, uh, for a person that was born in 1980, uh, basically we will see that in the next 20 or 30 years, we will observe a very strong impact. But uh, a child that is born in 2020, basically we will see very high uh, climate change if we do not reduce the uh, emission as quickly as possible. And climate is a conjunction, it is an indicator of the social and economic issues. And one of the critical changes that our planet will see is the change in biodiversity. So the risk of, his, uh, of his species losses, if you go from 1.5 to 2 degrees or 3 or 4 degrees, change dramatically. And our society depends on the biodiversity for our own survival. So basically, uh, climate change is not just climate, it's also a biodiversity crisis. And then to finish, there are many multiple opportunities to reduce emissions with the solar uh, energy, with the wind energy, uh, reducing deforestation that's basically very necessary for Brazil. And we'll see that many of these strategies the costs are lower than the technology will do today. So basically we can reduce emissions, even saving uh, a lot of money for our society. And then it's up to us to discuss which kind of trajectory we'll go from now until along this century, uh, we can continue increasing the global warming uh, treaty to our society or we can dramatically change it, goes to a sustainable development and we'll see uh, strong reductions in global emissions. So basically, we, uh, we, have to, uh, choose, we have to choose today. If you want a uh, low climate risk, SDG achievements, equity and justice, or if you want ecosystem degradation, maladaptation, high emissions, large uh, inequalities in our world. So basically I finish showing the 17 uh, sustainable development goals where climate change is one of them, uh, SDG 13, but of course without a stable climate, many of the other SDGs will never be achievable. So I leave you uh, with a picture of, uh, of our possible new planet if you do not reduce emissions and it's not, it will not be a very happy planet, I can assure you. So thank you very much. I will be ready to answer uh, any questions uh, later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Atasha, for that urgent call for action. Uh, I don't think I'm reaching out too much when I say that I think most of the people on the line today will agree with you that we wanna follow the sustainable development trajectory. Uh, let me yield the floor to our next speaker, Martin. Uh, please go ahead. The floor is yours when you are ready. And a reminder while you're pulling up your slides to everyone in the room that we're going to have time for discussion. And please send your questions for our panelists, either through the chat or the Q&A feature. Robin, just, just, let's just introduce Martin, OK? Yes. Sorry, Renato, please. Yeah, Martin Dietrich Brau is a lead researcher at the Economic Center on Sustainable Investment where he leads economic and legal research, training and an advisory work with a focus on legal and policy frameworks and practices for sustainable investment to achieve climate change mitigation and adaptation goals. He holds an LLM in international legal studies from New York University School of Law. Uh, welcome Martin and we have a pleasure to receive you here. Thank you very much, uh, Renato, 
thank you uh, to SDSN and also to Geo Geopark Quadrilatero Perifero for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. And um, here at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, CCSI, we have extensive research experience in how the mining sector can and should contribute to achieving climate goals to counter the crisis that Dr. Artasha was just uh, talking uh, about right now. So we um, understand that addressing this crisis will have to address both mitigation goals, how the mining sector can meaningfully contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And at the same time, it will help, uh, if, uh, the mining sector will have to be engaged in uh, the need for the world to adapt to those climate impacts, to become more resilient to the physical impacts of climate change. Today's presentation focused on climate change impacts on mining operations and mining territories invites us to, to think about the adaptation and uh, resilience side of the coin, not so much on the mitigation side. So we at CCSI have done quite a bit of work both on mitigation and adaptation, but my presentation here We'll focus on the adaptation and resilience aspects. And just to clarify, I will not have uh, slides for the first part of the presentation, uh, but I will at the end just showcase a few of uh, our publications that serve as the basis of what I will be talking about and that are all freely available online for you to download if you're interested in, in learning more and uh, exploring more uh, in terms of what CCSI has been doing in this space. So to start, it's of course very important to ask the question when you think, when we think of climate change in mining, how can and how will the mining sector adapt and become more resilient to climate change risks and impacts because that's fundamental to the survival of the mining sector as a business in the world with a changing climate that was just presented to us. But here at CCSI, we examine the issue of mining and uh, climate change adaptation and resilience through a broader lens. So we do ask the question of how the mining sector will adapt, but we also think about sustainability and climate action more broadly. Our starting point is that mining activities are inherently hazardous, even if the climate weren't changing. And mining activities introduce risks and impacts that can be exacerbated by the climate changes that we're experiencing. So for example, mining activities can compete with local communities, indigenous communities for water resources in the area where the mining uh, is operating and in areas where water stress risk is already increasing because of climate change. Mining operations can also exacerbate risks and impacts of climate related events. So for example, mining activities can contribute to deforestation, which exacerbates erosion, landslides, flooding in the rainy seasons. At the same time as mining has this interface with climate impacts, the mining sector has technological and economic capacity to prepare for, to prevent, and to control these risks and impacts to a greater extent. Of course, some of it is unavoidable, but the mining sector has a capacity to, to foresee and to, to be prepared. And therefore, mining companies have a responsibility to address these climate-related risks and impacts that mining activities uh, create or exacerbate. So we need uh, to, to ask ourselves, how can and should the mining sector play its part in supporting their host communities and their host countries in adapting to climate impacts and in becoming more resilient to those impacts? And here at CCSI, we understand that the engagement of the mining sector in climate action, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation, can benefit all stakeholders, communities, um, mining communities that are uh, affected, or indigenous communities, or more broadly uh, communities within the host state of the mining uh, activities can reap sustainable development benefits of uh, more investment, for example, in renewable energy in, in terms of mitigation, but also climate resilient infrastructure that the mine will build. They can reap benefits in terms of reduced poverty and inequality and realized human rights. Workers can also benefit from upskilling, reskilling opportunities, 
resource-rich states can benefit from sustained revenue flows that would uh, come from these uh, mining activities if they are operated uh, in accordance with climate goals and mining companies that reinvest, reinvent and uh, invest in um, climate resilient operations will also uh, thrive in, in an economy uh, that is where climate change considerations are increasingly important. Of course, for us to tackle these impacts uh, and the interface between mining and climate, we need to have conducive legal frameworks for the governance of uh, mining sector activities. Domestic laws are the, the ideal uh, legal instrument to regulate how mining, uh, the, the mining sector contributes to climate action, both on mitigation and adaptation. But when there aren't those laws, sometimes governments use climate related provisions in contracts or contract models or community development agreements to advance those climate goals in the sector. And in our view, the responsibility that mining companies has as a result of the hazardous nature of their activity should be embedded in these legal frameworks, which will be reflected in statutes and laws or regulations or contractual instruments. And um, our focus here at CCSI is precisely to uh, look at how these legal provisions, whether in laws or contracts or regulations, can shape and drive mining investment so that mining investment helps build resilience and contribute to adaptation and, and uh, climate resilience. So I'll just mention a few of our examples drawn from our lessons learned and our studies. It's constantly a work in progress. We're all, always learning more and understanding better how the mining sector can contribute. Uh, one area where we feel like it's particularly important for uh, legal frameworks to, to govern uh, mining activities in this in this uh, interface with climate change is in the environmental and social impact assessments and environmental and social management plans of the mines. They have to provide for protection for surface and groundwater, provide for net zero deforestation requirements, progressive restoration of forests to minimize the, the impact that deforestation has, in, in local communities require also climate vulnerability assessments in, in these processes, covering areas of health, water, forests, biodiversity. And another area then would be emergency and disaster response. Mining companies can uh, have a role and responsibilities in supporting governments, even outside of mining areas and, and preparing for uh, disasters that may be related to climate change. Post-closure and land use planning is another area where regulation is needed to require mine closure and rehabilitation plans also to consider climate change impacts already from the outset, already from the design phase. Uh, also, uh, another area where regulation will be important is the uh, physical stability of tailings. Um, taking into consideration the need to design, operate, and maintain tailings. Um, in line with international standards and uh, stress testing them for all climate scenarios that uh, Dr. Artasha was presenting to us, uh, allowing for best available technologies to be used, et cetera. Um, a, few, a few more details that, that we can offer in terms of re reducing deforestation, especially in contracts, governments can use these instruments to require companies to account for direct, indirect, and induced impacts on, on forests at every stage of the mining operations. They can require under a contract the, that the mining company can use a climate risk assessment and a community vulnerability assessment, require that mining companies comply with national adaptation plans and climate adaptation guidelines where these guidelines exist. Um, also, community development requirements contained in, in community development agreements could require mining companies to incorporate uh, climate adaptation strategies when these strategies are required by local, indigenous, and other affected communities. Contracts can also help regulate uh, the use of water 
um, including strict requirements on water use efficiency, including penalties for when mines overuse water or release water uh, wastewater that is not treated, and also providing mechanisms for communities that are downstream stream of the mine and that are affected or whose water rights are affected to have a grievance mechanism to, to uh, express their concerns when their water rights are affected by uh, mines upstream. Then we, we, can, we can keep talking and, and give examples here, uh, but I will just skip to, to one final point on uh, the need to integrate climate risks and just transition aspects into mine closure plans. Um, climate change has to be a consideration by the mining company already out at the outset. It has to plan in advance for the closure of the mine, for the environmental rehabilitation of the mine site, and already at that stage requiring mining companies to integrate climate risks into those plans. So for example, mandating that the closure plan is already submitted at the beginning of the project along with the environmental and social impact assessment describing how the company intends to avoid or, or mitigate environmental impacts that are associated with mining operations covering rehabilitation strategies that reflect an understanding between the changing relationship between the ecosystem and the climate requiring mining companies to model the long-term sustainability of rehabilitation pro uh, projects, et cetera. And the importance of including all these issues already in the closer plan is to set aside resources from the, the beginning of the exploration of, of the res resource and plan in advance for the end of the extracted project, because it is after all an exhaust exhaustible resource. And uh, the mine site needs to be uh, rehabilitated in a way that is climate resilient for the project sites, for the benefit of the communities. Uh, consideration also has to be given to the reskilling of the workforce, to uh, diversify the economy of the project affected community, and to address other socioeconomic and environmental risks and impacts that um, may be exacerbated because of climate change. Another final tool that I'll, I'll mention here is. Um, the, the usefulness of requiring mining companies to purchase insur insurance policies. So mining companies can plan uh, for quite a bit of these impacts, but for those that they can't plan, they should be insured against uh, and have specific tools to, to protect them uh, based on any site specific risks. And just to, just to wrap up, I just wanted to quickly run through a, a presentation here. Uh, just to showcase a few of our publications, this um, slide deck will be available for you later. I hope you can see the slides. Um, and this is essentially based on our project here on reforming mining uh, sector governance for climate change mitigation and adaptation goals. We have publications where we studied this, these specific aspects of policy that could help drive uh, mining activities to tackle climate change considerations directly and head on and incorporating uh, these issues into their, their business plans. Um, also on allocation of climate uh, related risks in mining contracts. So uh, a lot of resources that you can check here with all the links that you can click on later on. We've also assessed water related risks in the mining sector. Uh, these publications are also available on our website looking into how uh, my uh, governance frameworks deal with uh, water uh, use and water waste, wastewater discharge in the mining sector. We've also conducted research on how to integrate renewable energy into mining operations. So this is on the mitigation side, not so much on the adaptation, but on how mining companies can also contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And we've very recently uh, with several partners worked on developing a roadmap to decarbonize mining value chains, focusing on copper and nickel uh, mining value chains. All of these publications are freely available, as I mentioned at the outset. You can check them out uh, on the specific uh, pages that we have on extractives and climate, uh, or otherwise you can just visit us uh, at ccsi.columbia.edu. You're also welcome, very welcome to reach out to me by email if you're interested in learning more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin, and thank you to our other speakers for turning on their cameras for our discussion. 
Um, I'm going to start with a couple questions that I think are linked um, and a nice dialogue I think that we can initiate between uh, our speakers. I would love to hear from Paolo um, just the state of science on the projections for climate change and how accurate you think you can get it down at a scale that is um, like reasonable for a specific operation mining uh, to plan ahead in a way that, you know, how much uncertainty are they or are they not dealing with at this point? Um, and then going from that, I'd love to kick it back to Martin with a question that we got from um, Ben Bowie, which is how would you characterize the way that these impacts are being factored into new mine planning and is there variability between companies or commodities? I think that'll you know be a nice uh, two sides of the coin here. Okay, uh, going quickly. Basically uncertainty is part of science. There is no science without the uncertainty. It can be large, it can be small, depends on the condition. Uh, so we, uh, as I show some of the maps of changing precipitation, for instance, we we'll see that uh, we have right now a global for climate forecast with the 10 to 20 kilometers resolution or even better in, in some cases. So basically we have very high resolution in terms of our climate models, but of course there are uncertainties in forecast, especially if you go from 50 years from now or 100 years from now. Most of the people think that the uncertainty is basically due to the climate model. No, the uncertainty is due to the, uh, how much will be the emissions in terms of greenhouse gases in 10, 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. So the uncertainty is most on the socioeconomic issues uh, that uh, unfortunately makes it very difficult to do reliable and much more precise forecast for climate for individual regions. Martin, if you want to jump in then, um, or if you want, I can repeat the other half of the question. Thank you, Lauren. I think I, I think I have it here. So the question was on um, how I would characterize the way in which these factors are being considered, whether there's vari variation across companies, across uh, metals. I can talk a little bit about what I know, which is based on the analysis of contracts that we did in um, a couple of years ago on how mining uh, uh, companies are tackling and, and governments, of course, and, and their comp uh, mining companies and, com and uh, governments and their contracts, how they are dealing those with those uh, aspects in, um, in their legal instruments. So I will start by saying that it's also um, a challenge to um, know exactly how these issues are dealt with because there is limited transparency on um, the, the instruments to begin with, right? So there's a, a database that we use for our analysis, resourcecontracts.org, which CCSI maintains uh, with a couple of partners, which is the source of uh, the legal instruments that we've uh, analyzed uh, of publicly available uh, mining, uh, investor state mining contracts that we've analyzed. And I, I wouldn't be able to, to, to make a comparison between types of minerals or even companies. Uh, I wouldn't be in a position to, to do that at this point. But what I will say is that, yes, there are very widely diverging um, degrees of awareness of these issues and degrees to which these concerns have been incorporated in existing contracts. Um, we have found that many contracts that we analyzed are silent on many of the issues that I briefly talked about. They're silent on obligations for mining companies not to, to or to, to ensure that net zero deforestation is happening or that uh, they have, you know, biodiversity uh, rehabilitation or forest recovery obligations or that they consider climate risks in closure plans or that they hire um, climate related insurance. So many contracts are silent on those um, issues. Uh, of course, our analysis was centered around contracts. So it may well be that if we looked at, uh, uh, more deeply into national legislations, uh, we would find some requirements on mining companies in, in statutory law. But I, uh, you know, my impression is that that would be uh, even 
less likely that we would find more details, detailed provisions and laws because regulatory frameworks, legal and regulatory frameworks tend to evolve even more slowly. It's obviously much easier to adapt a contract and to, to bring those concerns into a contract than to approve a new law or to reform a mining law or an, an environmental law. And many of these um, projects are happening in, in developing countries that are lagging behind in terms of um, bringing their uh, legal and regulatory frameworks up to speed to address these climate uh, challenges. I don't mean to, to I don't mean to, to say that uh, developed country developed countries are doing that much of a better job, but uh, of course developing countries have resources um, and uh, resource limitations and and other challenges that make it even uh, more difficult to, to tackle those issues. So in in some, my answer to your question is that there's wide variability across uh, the countries that we've analyzed and that were far, um, just like with climate action generally, unfortunately, we're far below uh, the level of ambition and action that we should be um, that we should be at in order to, to be able to, to tackle the, the climate emergency properly. I think this other question we have in the chat might actually be best answered by um, Renato, but I don't know, Martin, you might also want to come in on it a little better. We have a question about, are there any concrete cases of specific technologies that you could implement in mining operations that allow companies to adapt? Um, I think maybe, Renato, that you're working a little bit more closer in the field uh, with operations maybe than uh, our other two panelists. Uh, I, uh, Laurie, I will, I'll use this opportunity to eventually make some question before, and then we can go to the, to the answer to, to the specific question. Well, I, as I raised in the beginning of the, of the opening, uh, we will be uh, targeting in the next seminars big issues for mining. And when I, big, I may say big issues, both in terms of, of value, okay, of intervention, the size of intervention, as the, the long time, okay? And the question they also we, ha we have to ask, to ask is, is the mining sector uh, planning for the future in those specific questions? And then talking about that, about the many, many uh, big issues, but represented by climate change, uh, we, we learned from, from Martin that SDG is, is a kind of a, a vector of, of concern, internal governance, internal concern. But my question is the following. Is SDG not too, too much domestic, okay, right now? Uh, I don't know about any, any other companies and how they could, should eventually uh, uh, let's say change their strategies for the future based on adaptation of the SDG for the big issues. This can be a question for the two. And when they finish, I can answer the question of the, of the audience. Okay, eventually I can start. You know, the SDGs, you know, were, were designed to be implemented in all scales, Renato, from the global, to country level, to state level, and to municipal level. Of course, you know, each different level have different requirements. It's easier to implement some of the strategies, but without a global effort, you know, getting all the scales, we could never reach the SDGs either at the individual country level to globally. So basically you have it to work in all levels. And this makes it very difficult because globally we do not have a governance to do that. So basically the COPs and the United Nations do not even have a mandate to deal, for instance, with the climate change issue, you know. They were done in the post-war, you know, to accommodate the distribution of power between the big uh, countries. So basically, uh, developing countries have no, practically no word on these policies. And then we have a very serious global governance issue. At the country level, of course, you are much, much better. 
at the country level and the state level and at municipal level, it's a task for all of us to really uh, implement the SDGs. That is the only way uh, is structured so far to achieve a minimum of sustainable development in the next decades. Martin? Renato, I, I wanted to clarify with you because I'm not sure you meant SDGs or ESG. No, ESG, and depending... ESG, ESG, I'm sorry. So in terms of S, the SDG framework, I think uh, Paulo has done an amazing job here and I, I don't need to, to refer to that. Um, in terms of ESG ratings, I think there, there's very little certainty around how these ratings are uh, formulated, the criteria that are considered, and even within the financial community, there's quite a bit of, of pushback now that ESG ratings have served mostly for, uh, not mostly, but uh, occasionally for uh, greenwashing and not really leading to uh, investment that tackles uh, the, the problems that the SDGs, <laughs> referring to, to, to Paulo's uh, explanation, the SDGs seek to address, right? So an S ESG, uh, uh, based strategy doesn't necessarily tackle the SDGs, which are the goals that we uh, should be um, focusing on. And I, I think there's skepticism generally. Uh, we at VTSI certainly have skepticism about uh, the ESG frameworks and ratings currently out there, precisely because they're so vague, uncertain, and often um, focused on reducing risks for the operations, but not necessarily taking a, a broader uh, sustainability perspective that would be necessary and that the SDGs do provide. So that's those are my two cents on, on the applicability of ESGs and the usefulness, very limited usefulness of this framework um, for now, in my view. Thank you. I, I, I apologize for making wrong uh, the, the, the conflict with the, between ESG and SDG. Okay, many, many codes. Oh, and referring to the question that came from the audience, I may, I may say that's the following. Uh, certainly the, the, the countries can be the, the companies in each country that even have more severe or less severe uh, climate change conditions right now, they can share the technologies and practices they are, they are doing in terms of really improving, okay? And I understand that ICMM certainly is doing that. Uh, the second is that with the disasters that is, are happening uh, around the world, and the, we can make put an example of the two one in Brazil. Certainly, there is a lot of technology that was developed by pressure because they have to solve the response to the to, to the disasters. And for example, what to do with the residues, okay, and what to do with the dams. What, what are the new engineering uh, parameters for that? So uh, I understand that the, the, the pressure from society, the pressure from, from uh, let's say, from safety demands and the pressure for, 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 for international, uh, let's say, a value of the companies. So that they, this will uh, speed up the response in technology. Yeah? But it's also important, Renato, to mention that the latest IPCC report makes it very clear that we have all the technology available right now to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030. So basically, we do not have to invent anything new. All the technology is here, readily available, ready to be implemented. You know, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel to have a much more sustainable climate in the second part of this century. What we really lack is the issue of the governance and also pressure from the industries because of course the industries in general have a lot of to lose in terms of climate change uh, as the uh, global, uh, global uh, fund make it very, very clear. 
So basically our society is in a clear transition moment that I think that you have only way to go forward. That is the way to reduce the greenhouse emissions, reduce the risks of a business like mining and other business are having in and build a, build a much more sustainable society. That's the only way to go. Yeah, so the, so the challenge we may say that is local and global. Okay? So we have to look for the local more for the domestic safety of the companies and the territories and global and really to work together in a big cooperation framework to really make change because that's the only way. Um, Maybe I can. Oh, ahead. sorry. Sorry, sorry, Lauren. Maybe I can jump in uh, to, to reinforce Paulo's point. Um, and it's a publication that I briefly mentioned at the end and I just dropped the link in the chat here, but it's also in the um, the deck that will be circulated with you. It's this uh, study that we've uh, conducted on a, a net zero roadmap for uh, a copper and nickel value chains, which was sponsored by IFC and CCSI is one of the partners that uh, developed the study. Uh, and just to reinforce the point that many of these technologies are already available or will be available at scale to help decarbonize mining uh, operations uh, by 2050, not only to reach the 50% uh, reduction that's needed by 2030, but also to, um, to reach net zero by 2050. And we're talking about uh, increasing the renewable energy presence on, on site, uh, bringing site operational uh, energy efficiency improvements, process optimization, uh, zero emission haulage trucks, process heaps, electrification, green hydrogen. All of these solutions are already in the pipeline to be to support mining sector the mining sector in decarbonizing its operations and playing its part towards net zero it just has to be done and yes we do need the governance framework that is uh, not fully in place um, but at the same time mining companies have a comparative advantage to to get a head start and to show that they can produce sustainably and that they can um, produce a higher the product itself will be the same, but the impact of the product will be different in, tr in terms of its environmental quality and its climate integrity, right? So mining companies can take the lead in, in showing that they're, they can um, bring their operations to net zero and also use them to, to build community resilience and help uh, communities adapt to climate change. I was going to try to get uh, just a couple last questions in uh, before our time ends. We have a question from Erilyn Spink that I'm going to address. Uh, she's asking if SDSN has a position on the sustainability of extraction based on the type of metal or mineral. Um, the complicated, the short answer to that is no, uh, and the longer answer is just that it's more complicated because the methods of extraction, the regulatory frameworks, the companies that are operating, the scales at which they're operating um, are so different from country to country and even within countries from region to region um, that we don't have a blanket statement on that uh, because it depends highly on the local contexts. Uh, if anybody else wants to tackle that, uh, you can chime in on it as well. But since it was a question about an SDSN position, I thought I would take it. The one that I wanted to turn to you guys uh, is a question from Nimal Valipuram, which is about uh, the need for minerals and metals for the transition to the renewable economy. And how is the mining sector going to manage uh, their own mining footprint when we need this dramatic upscale, upscale in uh, the production of these, these minerals and, and metals for the energy transition? Uh, maybe Martin first on that one and then Paolo. Sure, happy to. I think the uh, solutions that I um, referred to just now are a start of an answer, right? Uh, how, how are companies going to address their footprint by implementing, to begin with, net zero uh, strategies? Uh, and But it's, of course, not only about addressing climate change, right? It's also about uh, tackling other environmental issues, tackling the impact of mining operations on water resources and uh, biodiversity loss 
and communities that are affected by other types of local pollution, disruptions in the local environment. Uh, at the same time uh, that all of this has to be managed and in our view, it has to be managed in light of regulatory frameworks and not just by um, private sector initiatives uh, operating alone. Um, and at the same time, they have to be negotiated with the communities that are most affected to um, by the impacts of, of the mining um, uh, operations and that are really on the ground and experiencing that, that footprint uh, closer to, they're closer to that footprint than any any one of us rem, uh, that may be more removed from them. And maybe another element that I would bring here um, is that mining companies could also explore um, getting more deeply into the circular economy and exploring how mining companies can uh, function more as materials companies that also work in recycling and recovering materials that are used to to complement obviously we will not be able to supply all the minerals and, and materials needed for the energy transition and for future gener future generations and all the technologies that we need to build not all of it will, will come from recycling or reuse or repurposing but some of it can and if uh if we can maximize you know reusing making the most out of the materials that have already been extracted we can also extract less and reduce the uh, footprint of extraction through uh, through that pathway as well yeah i would like to remember that actually uh for me you know the mining industry does not actually have a very good environmental records not just in brazil but everywhere Let's remind of the coal mining, for instance, especially in developing countries, as well gold mining in Amazonia with lots and tons and tons of mercury being released into the ecosystem. So basically the environmental record of mining activities actually very bad. So how to improve that? You know, uh, that is the reality right now. And, uh, according to the question, the need for metals on the energy transition will certainly put a lot of pressure on this particular sector. We can, of course, as Martin mentioned, you know, invest in recycling that will be absolutely necessary for lithium and battery materials. But certainly, even with the very heavy recycling that does not happen right now, with the exception of aluminum, uh, we will have serious uh, environmental problems. So it's a particular industry where the society itself has to follow very closely in order of not getting our serious environmental problems we have in Brazil and many other countries that are affected by mining activity does not go uh, much worse than they have been today. So for that, the industry, the society will have to work very closely because that's a very, very serious issue. And the demands for the society can, I can only see that they can make this uh, issue even more serious yet with more environmental damage as we see today from this particular industry. Lauren, may I just finish? Yes, please. Well, uh, what we can eventually raise as a, as a conclusion, one of the conclusions for, for this webinar, and based on the, the talks by Paulo and Martin, is that eventually in another webinar, we may bring the governance of these big issues, okay? And eventually the mining company, they, they may change from the, the local governance and eventually go to the country governance and to the global governance, okay? Because the issues are becoming too serious and too long-term to be resolved uh, very quickly. So governance of the, of the climate change, governance of, of water and governance of other issues certainly have to be reviewed. We are almost out of time. Uh, maybe we'll do one last uh, round robin circle. I don't know if anybody has final closing remarks, um, but if you do, we'll go Paolo and then Martin and then uh, Renata will have our very uh, final 
final remarks. Uh, and this will be the last time I speak. So I'll just thank everyone for being with us for this hour. So I just want to thank for this important discussion. It's a critical industry in terms of environmental and social uh, economic impacts. And at the same time, it's a strategic industry for the future of the planet. So this makes this debate very, very important. You know, of course, we are not closing the issues. We not have uh, really sensible recommendations other than uh, to pay attention that this particular industry should follow the 17 sustainable development goals. That is the only best way to build a, a more uh, just, a more equal society as well as a more sustainable society. So let's press not just mining industry, but all the economic activities in our planet, you know, to a more sustainable society in order to build a better society than we have today. I would also just briefly thank you for, again, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to, to participate in the webinar and just to reinforce that I'm always very interested in um, continuing the exchanges post webinar. We're always learning, always interested here at CCSI and continuing to explore how we can improve the governance of the mining sector to reach the SDGs. Uh, as my colleague has just uh, mentioned, it, it's super important to, to have all these factors always under consideration. Uh, all the, the 17 SDGs, climate is a very important one of them, but we, we cannot neglect the others. Thank you once again, and we'll stay in touch, I hope. Well, finish from my side. Uh, it's, it's interesting that although we have a lot of news, bad news from about climate change, we still see a lot of incredulity and passivity, okay? And so that nothing is either, either nothing will happen or either uh, or no, they, they are, they let society cannot make anything. So uh, talk about mine in the territories. Certainly this can be a vector of integration of the, of the, of the plans for the future. So the mine industry can use the, uh, a very dense network uh, framework and together with other frameworks really create a, 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 a unity because I don't see the, the petrochemical working with the mining and working with the, the, the energy. They are separated, okay? So the only solution I see, again, turning back to governance is that their frameworks work together. Okay? Thank you so much. With that, we'll close it out. Thank you everyone again for joining us. I wish everyone a great rest of your day and whatever time zone you're in. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you.